Some more video time. This video is going to be on talking about the formal definition of a limit. Let's take a look at what this is. All right. Here's the definition. We're going to state it. And then we're going to talk about what it means. Limit definition of a function. Let's say we got a function f of x. And it's got some domain d, which is a subset of the real numbers. And we also got some range are also a subset of the real numbers. We're gonna let C be an accumulation point of D, so that's in the domain here. Then we say that the real number L is a limit of the function F at this location C if for every epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a delta bigger than zero so that the distance between f of x and l is always less than this epsilon whenever we have that for a value of x in the domain, the distance between x and this location c is always less than delta, but assumed to be positive. So that's literally the definition. We say that the limit of a function f at c is this real number l. If for every epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a delta bigger than zero, such that the magnitude of f of x minus l is less than epsilon whenever we have that the magnitude between x and c, the distance that is, is less than delta and positive. So you say, okay, that's great. Firstly, let's just rewrite this out using quantifiers. So that statement right above is equivalent to saying that L is the limit of the function F at C if we have, for all positive epsilon, there exists a delta bigger than zero, such that zero less than magnitude X minus C less than delta implies that F of X minus L in magnitude is less than delta, uh, less than epsilon when X is in the domain D. So you still might say, well, what does that mean, right? Well, let's conceptually break this down, what it means. So what is this telling us? Okay, line by line down here. We're requiring this to be true, right? So you go to the location C, and then if you're within some delta distance from this location, then really what we're saying is we can make X arbitrarily close to C without letting X take on the value of C. Hence, deleting X equals C from that consideration. So, you know, we should notice that F need not be defined at X equals C, but yet this limit L could still exist. Moreover, even if the function evaluated at C is defined, but it does not equal L, we could still find this limit. So really what we're saying is we, we could be defined at this location X equals C. We might not be defined. Either way, we could still consider taking the limit of the function at C, assuming C is an accumulation point, and by doing certain things and requiring certain conditions. Okay, so that still is like, well, I don't know what. All right, well, what else? Moreover, we require that for any x value in the deleted neighborhood with radius delta, right? That's talking about that statement right there. Then, no matter how big or small we make that deleted neighborhood with radius delta, we can always find some other positive number, epsilon, so that the function f of x 
the outputs are in the neighborhood of radius epsilon. The picture down here will hopefully get across really the requirements that we're talking about. And that is, <clears throat> down here, you see we have some arbitrary little delta neighborhood around C. Right? So you move to the left and you move to the right, delta units from C, and we got this deleted neighborhood, of course, not uh, considering that C has to be in there. What we're saying is, whenever that's true, then the function's outputs on the vertical axis up there should be within some epsilon neighborhood of this limiting number L. So no matter how small we make the delta neighborhood around C, but not necessarily including the C, then we can always say that L has some epsilon neighborhood around it. If that happens, if we can always find such a epsilon, then we say that the limit of the function f at c is the real number l. So that's really what this definition is getting across. It's an implication. We go back up here to the definition right here. It's an implication, right? So we got to say that when we can make this deleted neighborhood around c in the x direction with radius delta, we can always go and find that the function's output around L has some epsilon neighborhood as well. We got an example here. We're going to try it out. Okay. So something, you know, somewhat straightforward, hopefully to get across the technique and what we're really getting into is that let's consider this limit. Remember your notation. Limit is x approaches 5 of the linear function here, 2x minus 1. We're going to show that that limit is equal to 9. We're going to prove it. And we're going to prove it using the formal definition of a limit. So, how do you go about doing this? Okay, so let's dissect this little paragraph of mathematical statements right here. This is a general strategy, okay? So follow along, please. Let's let the function f be this 2x minus 1, okay? We're trying to construct the definition of limit. <clears throat> and we'll say that's true for all x that's real because it's linear function. Uh, it's defined everywhere, so it's always going to be true. And, of course, since we're taking the limit as x is approaching 5, right? here's my x-axis, here's 5, we're approaching from both sides to 5. So hence, that's the location of our accumulation point, uh, which it definitely is because this function is defined everywhere. And we're going to let that C value be 5 here. So that's our accumulation point. And we want to show that using the limit definition, the limit that we're looking for, L here, is equal to 9, right? So you got in your limit notation up here that x approaching 5 that's x approaching your accumulation point c here which is 5 we got to take the limit of the function f and we're trying to show that this limit is 9 which is our l what's our goal the goal is now to show that for every positive epsilon value we're going to be able to find a delta value bigger than zero so that this statement right here x minus the accumulation point so x minus five in magnitudes less than delta is always implying that f of x minus nine or two x minus one minus nine in magnitude is less than epsilon that's what we got to show we got to show that to be true so if we could prove it using our proof techniques, then we will have proved the limit. So the general strategy for a lot of these limits, when we're using the formal definition, is let's go and try to find a relationship between delta and epsilon. Okay, that's really the big goal. 
Well, how do we do that? A lot of times you just start with the statement of f of x minus l here in magnitude. So there's our f of x minus l. And see what happens. Maybe something nice happens. Now here, 2x minus 1, the function, minus 9, the place that we're claiming the limit is going to be, that's just the same as magnitude 2x minus 10, of course, just combining like terms. And then by properties of absolute value and factoring, you factor out that 2 is the same as 2 times the magnitude x minus 5. But remember, we, ain't, we need this relationship with delta and epsilon, so you see that this right here is like saying 2 times magnitude x minus 5, which we're hoping to be less than delta. Excuse me, 2 delta, right? Because up there, we have that magnitude x minus 5 is less than delta. So if I just multiply through that inequality by 2, I get this inequality right here. But of course, this entire statement that we're dissecting right down here, magnitude 2x minus 1 minus 9, f of x minus l, that's less than delta, right? So we need these two conditions to be true, and hence what we should do is pick epsilon to be 2 times delta because of this. So we choose an epsilon in this way, which is also equivalent to saying that delta should be epsilon over 2. So a lot of these limits that you're going to consider trying to prove, this is the strategy. Dissect one part of that implication, specifically the epsilon part, and then hopefully we're able to construct a relationship with the fact that the accumulation part should be less than delta and pick our delta in relationship to the particular epsilon that we need. So none of this is the proof yet. It's just kind of a side work to figure out the relationship between delta and epsilon. And of course, if there's uh, the limit's going to exist, then there has to be some type of relationship one way or another. So therefore, here's the actual proof. We have that for f of x equals 2x minus 1 for any real number x, then for every positive epsilon, there exists a delta, which we're going to say is just epsilon over 2. Notice that has to be positive because epsilon is positive. So there exists this delta epsilon over 2, which is positive, so that when we have that the magnitude x minus 5 is less than delta and positive, this implies that f of x minus 9, f of x minus l, is less than epsilon through this relationship up here. So it is implied that by our computations that we found above, we now have shown that it is true. The limit as x goes to 5 of this function here, 2x minus 1, is equal to 9. The end. So that's a proof. But we got to come up with this relationship between epsilon and delta in order to show the limit definition stands. And once we do that, we will have proven that a limit exists in that particular situation. So that's a little intro video on it. And that's it. So guess what? It's time to listen to a beat. Next video, we're going to start talking about some properties of limits. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>